When Americans are wounded in Afghanistan or Iraq, no expense is spared to save their lives. But once they're home, if they've suffered an amputation of their arm, they usually end up wearing an artificial limb that hasn't changed much since World War II. In all the wonders of modern medicine, building a robotic arm with a fully functioning hand has not been remotely possible. But that's starting to change. You're about to see a remarkable leap in technology called the DECA arm. And it's just one of the breakthroughs in a $100 million Pentagon program called Revolutionizing Prosthetics. To see how far they've come, have a look at where they started. It's a basic hook, and I can rotate the hook like this and lock it. Fred Downs has been wearing the standard prosthetic arm since 1968, after he stepped on a landmine in Vietnam. In those days, they didn't have a lot of sophistication about it. It's just, uh, they'd fit you and say, this is your arm, this is your leg, and, and it was the best technology available in those days, and you just had to make yourself learn how to use it, and I did. Today, Downs is the head of prosthetics for the Veterans Administration. This technology has not changed since 1968, or, or even before. It was before. Actually, this arm was basically developed World War II era, after, after the war. There's a hook, something out of Peter Pan, and that just just unacceptable. Dr. Jeffrey Ling is an Army colonel and neurologist who's leading the revolutionizing prosthetics program. He's a physician with big dreams and little patience, especially when touring Walter Reed Army Medical Center and meeting the troops he's working for. We in the military have a saying, leave no one behind, and we're very serious about that. And that doesn't mean just on the battlefield, but also back at home. Ling told us they've made great strides in artificial legs, but a good arm has never been within their grasp. If you look at your hand, it's an incredibly complex piece of machine. What nature has provided us is extraordinary. The opposable thumb, the five finger, independently moving, articulated fingers. It's fantastic what this does. And when you lose your hand, you've lost something that makes you human. You're so right, Scott, because think about what makes us separate from every other animal species. We have an opposable thumb. That is, in fact, what makes us human. Colonel Ling is determined to give that humanity back. His project is run out of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the same group that oversaw the creation of night vision, stealth aircraft, and GPS. Yeah, give me a sense of the scale of this project. It's, um, it's a very large scale. It, it is very much like a Manhattan Project at, at that scope. Uh, it is uh, over $100 million investment now. It involves well over 300 um, uh, scientists, uh, that is engineers, neuroscientists, psychologists. One of the scientists Ling asked to join the team is Dean Kamen, a sort of rock star in the world of inventors who flies his own jet. It's the fastest non-military airplane you can buy right now anywhere in the world. His creations include dozens of medical devices and the Segway. It's very intuitive. Inventions which have made him a multimillionaire. When the folks from the Defense Department came to this office and said, here's what we need, what did they tell you? We want these kids to have something put back on them that will essentially allow one of these kids to pick up a raisin or a grape off a table. Know the difference without looking at it. That is an extraordinary goal. He basically said, you're crazy. That's what he told us, he said flat out. He, and he himself, who's a, who's a crazy guy himself, I mean, he is a very innovative thinker. He's a brilliant man, totally brilliant man, but a mad scientist. I thought they were unbelievably optimistic in their expectations, and I told him that. He said to us, he said, I can do, uh, Mark, uh, you're crazy, but we're willing to rise to, the, rise to the challenge because it's important. These are multi-axis machining centers. Kamen took us behind the scenes at DECA, his company in New Hampshire to show us how inspiration becomes invention. An engineer designs a part on a computer, he fires it up here on our network. Kamen and his team of 40 engineers spent a year working on the problem, and this is what they came up with. When you first started this, did you sit down at your desk and, and look at your hand and figure out how it worked? Well, most good engineering is some adaptation of what nature does. It all began by creating dozens of gears, joints, and computers that mimic nature's design. But then came the hard part, meeting DARPA's demand for an arm no larger than the average human's and no heavier than nine pounds. 
this is some of the electronics that fit inside the arm. Tell me about that. Well, this has three processors on it. Think of this as three PCs worth of computing power. And all of this just fits, it's round because it just fits in the wrist joint. In terms of the engineering, what was the toughest piece of this? All of it. <laughs> the prototype had 25 circuit boards and 10 motors, but it would be no good at all unless the patients were willing to accept it. We went and started talking to the real patients and potential users down at places like Walter Reed. And immediately we were shocked to learn even just the hollow plastic shell that they wear when they're out and about sweats and it hurts and it irritates. And we came back and realized that if we build the world's best nine pound arm, but nobody will wear it because 24 hours a day or 12 hours a day of wearing a nine pound arm is gonna be irritating and frustrating. Uh, we said, we've got a way bigger problem here. So Cayman's team created a new way to connect the DECA arm to the body using tiny balloons. And you'll notice now, if I hit this button, these things are inflating, and that's a nice, gentle pressure there, but if that's displaced all over your whole shoulder, that's an enormous amount of structure. So now the arm is gripping tight on the shoulder tight. so you can lift something right. heavy. And as soon as he's not gripping tight and heavy, one or the other might just deflate. Ready to put it on? Okay. Cayman asked Fred Downs, the VA official in charge of prosthetics, to take off the hook he'd been wearing for 40 years and give the new arm a try. I'm moving this around to see how stable my stump is inside here. The arm is controlled by flexing the shoulder and pressing buttons built into his shoes, almost as if he's typing with his toes. Ball of the foot, outside of the foot, and then toes. You were skeptical. Very, very skeptical. Because I've seen lots of inventions come along in the, my years of being in charge of prosthetics and uh, so uh, some great stuff but in the long run it doesn't really work because your body only has so much tolerance for gadgetry. After practicing for 10 hours, Down showed us what he could do. Now I use my toes to grasp this. Feeling is hard to describe. For the first time in 40 years, my, my left hand did this. <laughs> I almost choke up saying it now. It was just, um, it was such an amazing feeling. I was 23 years old the last time I did that. It felt so good to move my arm again, to do things with it. Not as fast, not as this, but it worked. You just said, move my arm yeah. again. Did it feel like your arm? It All did, it did. It felt like my arm. It was me. You sure I can't take this home with me, this arm? I'm ready for this arm. <laughs> if Downs is eager to have the DECA arm, imagine what it would mean to Chuck Hildreth, who lost both arms at the age of 18 in an electrical accident. Push the knob. Look at that. He's been volunteering at DECA for nearly two years. Now, it, it seems to me that one of the issues here would be that you don't have any feeling in this hand. So the question becomes, I mean, how do you pick up an egg? How do you pick up something that you, you might crush? How do you know? I have a vibrator sensor here that tells me how tightly I'm grabbing things. The more intense the grass, the more intense the vibration is. You know, you, you set me up here with a plate of grapes, and this I've got to see, OK? So let's, let's how do you pick up a grape without crushing it? Uh, No way. Consider, Chuck hasn't eaten like this in nearly 30 years. Many of the innovations in robotics that make this possible are already at work in artificial legs. Uh, these are the latest and greatest. Uh, these are the power knees. They actually have a motor inside them. They help propel me. Josh Blyle lost his legs in 2006 to a roadside bomb in Iraq. Last year, he became the first person in the world to walk on two of these. They're called power knees, legs that propel themselves and talk to each other to keep a constant speed in stride. How fast will these go? Faster than I can control, to be honest with you. <laughs> Not to a run yet, uh, but they do have a lot of power. Now, making a robotic arm that moves as naturally and effortlessly as these legs is the next step in revolutionizing prosthetics. 
Colonel Ling says the key is connecting the artificial limb straight into the nervous system. Remember, they lost an arm, but that big bundle of nerves that came out of the spinal cord still exists in their shoulders. So the nerves that control the arm, they're not necessarily lost they're not with necessarily the arm. Lost. Right. And the brain continues to send those signals to those nerves when a person imagines moving their missing limb. That is correct. I'm one of over 300 engineers uh, worldwide working on this. Jonathan Cunahom is uniquely qualified to figure out how to tap into those signals. He's a biomechanical engineer at Duke University who lost his arm to a roadside bomb in Iraq. Explain to me what you're doing with your right arm and the sensors and how that relates to uh, your new right hand. I'm imagining performing movements with my right hand and when I do that I'm moving the muscles that remain here in my arm. When those muscles move uh, they make little electrical impulses that we can detect with these electrodes. So I I imagine closing your hand for me. So I imagine flexing my wrist, uh, doing a key pinch. To be clear, Jonathan is controlling this robotic hand simply by thinking about moving his own hand that no longer exists. How much training is required to move this hand with those muscles? How long did it take you to learn how to do this? I'm not really learning so much as the computer is. I'm, I'm doing what I imagine I'd like to do, and we've taught the computer to interpret uh, the signals and, and do what it is. So it it's almost feels natural to you? It does. After four years and a hundred million dollars, arms controlled by thought are still a work in progress. But in the meantime, the DECA arm is headed to the VA for clinical testing in the hope that it will soon become available to the nearly 200 arm amputees from Iraq and Afghanistan. Nobody ever wants to put a price tag on making a soldier or a Marine whole again, but you're talking about $100 million. That's right. It's a big number. It's a huge number, but uh, it does a number of things. Number one is, of course, it fulfills our commitment to these uh, fine young men and women who the issue of money compared to what they have done for the, na the service of the nation becomes immaterial. However, this is not a classified military weapon system. This is a, an advancement in medical technology. And the beauty of this particular effort is that this is another gift of the American taxpayer to the entire world.